Section 4 of An Essay Concerning Human Understanding Book 3 of Words by John Locke This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Lorenowicz Chapter 4 of The Names of Simple Ideas 1. Names of simple ideas, modes, and substances have each something peculiar. Though all words, as I have shown, signify nothing immediately but the ideas in the mind of the speaker, yet upon a nearer survey we shall find the names of simple ideas, mixed modes, under which I comprise relations to, and natural substances, have each of them something peculiar and different from the other. For example, 2. First, names of simple ideas and of substances intimate real existence. First, the names of simple ideas and substances with the abstract ideas in the mind which they immediately signify intimate also some real existence, from which was derived their original pattern. But the names of mixed modes terminate in the idea that is in the mind and lead not the thoughts any further, as we shall see more at large in the following chapter. 3. Secondly, names of simple ideas and modes signify always both real and nominal essences. Secondly, the names of simple ideas and modes signify always the real as well as nominal essence of their species. But the names of natural substances signify rarely, if ever, anything but barely the nominal essences of those species, as we shall show in the chapter that treats of the names of substances in particular. 4. Thirdly, names of simple ideas are undefinable. Thirdly, the names of simple ideas are not capable of any definition. The names of all complex ideas are. It has not, that I know, been yet observed by anybody what words are, and what are not, capable of being defined. The want whereof is, as I am apt to think, not seldom the occasion of great wrangling and obscurity in men's discourses, while some demand definitions of terms that cannot be defined, and others think they ought not to rest satisfied in an explication made by a more general word and its restriction, or to speak in terms of art by a genus and difference, when, even after such definition made according to rule, those who hear it have often no more a clear conception of the meaning of the word than they had before. This, at least I think, that the showing what words are, and what are not, capable of definitions, and wherein consist a good definition, is not wholly besides our present purpose, and perhaps will afford so much light to the nature of these signs and our ideas, as to deserve a more particular consideration. 5. If all names were definable, it would be a process in infinitum. I will not here trouble myself to prove that all terms are not definable, from that progress in infinitum, which it will visibly lead us into, if we should allow that all names could be defined. For, if the terms of one definition were still to be defined by another, where at last should we stop? But I shall, from the nature of our ideas and the signification of our words, show why some names can and others cannot be defined, and which they are. 6. What a definition is. I think it is agreed that a definition is nothing else but the showing the meaning of one word by several other not synonymous terms, the meaning of words being only the ideas they are made to stand for by him that uses them. The meaning of any term is then showed, or the word is defined, when, by other words, the idea it is made the sign of, and annexed to, in the mind of the speaker, is as it were represented, or set before the viewer of another and thus its signification ascertained. This is the only use and end of definitions, and therefore the only measure of what is or is not a good definition. 7. Simple ideas, why undefinable? This being premised, I say that the names of simple ideas and those only are incapable of being defined. The reason whereof is this, that several terms of a definition, signifying several ideas, they can altogether by no means represent an idea which has no composition at all, and therefore a definition, which is properly nothing but the showing of meaning of one word by several others not signifying each the same thing, can in the names of simple ideas have no place. 8. 
Instances, Scholastic Definitions of Motion The not observing this difference in our ideas, and their names, has produced that eminent trifling in the schools which is so easy to be observed in the definitions they give us of some few of these simple ideas. For, as to the greatest part of them, even those masters of definitions were fain to leave them untouched, merely by the impossibility they found it in. What more exquisite jargon could the wit of men invent than this definition? The act of a being in power as far forth as in power, which would puzzle any rational man, to whom it was not already known by its famous absurdity, to guess what word it could ever be supposed to be the explication of. If Tully, asking a Dutchman what bewegenge was, should have received this explication in his own language, that it was actus entus in potentia, quatennis in potentia, I ask whether any one can imagine he could thereby have understood what the word bewegenge signified, or have guessed what idea a Dutchman ordinarily had in his mind, and would signify to another, when he used that sound. 9. Modern Definition of Motion nor have the modern philosophers, who have endeavored to throw off the jargon of the schools, and speak intelligibly, much better succeeded in defining simple ideas, whether by explaining their causes or any otherwise. The atomists, who define motion to be a passage from one place to another, what do they more than put one synonymous word for another? For what is passage other than motion? And if they were asked what passage was, how would they better define it than by motion? For is it not at least as proper and significant to say, passage is a motion from one place to another, as to say, motion is a passage, etc.? This is to translate, and not to define, when we change two words of the same signification one for another, which, when one is better understood than the other, may serve to discover what idea the unknown stands for, but is very far from a definition unless we will say every English word in the dictionary is the definition of the Latin word it answers, and that motion is a definition of motus, nor will the successive application of the parts of the superficies of one body to those of another, which the Cartesians give us, prove a much better definition of motion when well examined. 10. Definitions of Light The act of perspicuous as far forth as perspicuous is another peripatetic definition of a simple idea, which, though not more absurd than the former of motion, yet betrays its uselessness and insignificancy more plainly, because experience will easily convince any one that it cannot make the meaning of the word light, which it pretends to define, at all understood by a blind man, but the definition of motion appears not at first sight so useless, because it escapes this way of trial. For this simple idea, entering by the touch as well as sight, it is impossible to show an example of any one who has no other way to get the idea of motion, but barely by the definition of that name. Those who tell us that light is a great number of little globules, striking briskly on the bottom of the eye, speak more intelligibly than the schools. But yet these words never so well understood would make the idea the word light stands for no more known to a man that understands it not before, than if one should tell him that light was nothing but a company of little tennis balls, which fairies all day long struck with rackets against some men's foreheads, whilst they pass by others. For granting this explication of the thing to be true, yet the idea of the cause of light, if we had it never so exact, would no more give us the idea of light itself, as it is such a particular perception in us, than the idea of the figure and motion of a sharp piece of steel would give us the idea of that pain which it is able to cause in us. For the cause of any sensation, and the sensation itself, in all the simple ideas of one sense, are two ideas, and two ideas so different and distant one from another, that no two can be more so. And therefore, should Descartes' globules strike never so long on the retina of a man who was blind by a gutta serena, he would thereby never have any idea of light, or anything approaching it, though he understood never so well what little globules were, and what striking on another body was. And therefore, the Cartesians very well distinguish between that light which is the cause of that sensation in us, and the idea which is produced in us by it, and is that which is properly light. 11. Simple Ideas, Why Undefinable, Further Explained Simple ideas, as has been shown, 
are only to be got by those impressions objects themselves make on our minds, by the proper inlets appointed to each sort. If they are not received this way, all the words in the world, made use of to explain or define any of their names, will never be able to produce in us the idea it stands for. For, words being sounds, can produce in us no other simple idea than of those very sounds, nor excite any in us, but by that voluntary connection which is known to be between them in those simple ideas which common use has made them the signs of. He that thinks otherwise, let him try if any words can give him the taste of a pineapple, and make him have the true idea of the relish of that celebrated delicious fruit. So far as he is told it has a resemblance with any tastes whereof he has the ideas already in his memory, imprinted there by sensible objects, not strangers to his palate, so far may he approach that resemblance in his mind. But this is not giving us that idea by a definition, but exciting in us other simple ideas by their known names, which will be still very different from the true taste of that fruit itself. In light and colors and all other simple ideas, it is the same thing, for the signification of sounds is not natural, but only imposed and arbitrary, and no definition of light or redness is more fitted or able to produce either of those ideas in us than the sound light or red by itself. For, to hope to produce an idea of light or color by a sound, however formed, is to expect that sounds should be visible, or colors audible, and to make the ears do the office of all the other senses, which is all one as to say that we might taste, smell, and see by the ears, a sort of philosophy worthy only of Sancho Panza, who had the faculty to see Dulcinea by hearsay, and therefore he that has not before received into his mind, by the proper inlet, the simple idea which any word stands for, can never come to know the signification of that word by any other word or sounds whatsoever, put together according to any rules of definition. The only way is, by applying to his senses the proper object, and so producing that idea in him, for which he has learned the name already. A studious blind man, who had mightily beat his head about visible objects, and made use of the explication of his books and friends, to understand those names of light and colors which often came in his way, bragged one day, that he now understood what scarlet signified. Upon which, his friend demanding what scarlet was, the blind man answered, it was like the sound of a trumpet. Just such an understanding of the name of any other simple idea will he have, who hopes to get it only from a definition, or other words made use of to explain it. 12. The contrary shown in complex ideas, by instances of a statue and rainbow. The case is quite otherwise in complex ideas, which, consisting of several simple ones, it is in the power of words, standing for the several ideas that make that composition, to imprint complex ideas in the mind which were never there before, and so make their names be understood. In such collections of ideas, passing under one name, definition, or the teaching the signification of one word by several others, has place, and may make us understand the names of things which never came within the reach of our senses, and frame ideas suitable to those in other men's minds when they use those names. Provided that none of the terms of the definition stand for any such simple ideas, which he to whom the explication is made has never yet had in his thought. Thus the word statue may be explained to a blind man by other words, when picture cannot. His senses have given him the idea of figure, but not of colors, which therefore words cannot excite him. This gained the prize to the painter against the statuary, each of which contending for the excellency of his art, and the statuary bragging that his was to be preferred because it reached further, and even those who had lost their eyes could yet perceive the excellency of it. The painter agreed to refer himself to the judgment of a blind man, who being brought where there was a statue made by the one, and a picture drawn by the other, he was first led to the statue, in which he traced with his hands all the lineaments of the face and body, and with great admiration applauded the skill of the workman. But being led to the picture, and having his hands laid upon it, was told that now he touched the head, and then the forehead, eyes, nose, etc., and his hand moved over the parts of the picture on the cloth, without finding any the least distinction. Whereupon he cried out that certainly that must needs be a very admirable and divine piece of workmanship, which could represent to them all those parts where he could neither feel nor perceive anything. 13. 
colors indefinable to the born blind. He that should use the word rainbow to one who knew all those colors, but yet had never seen that phenomenon, would, by enumerating the figure, largeness, position, and order of the colors, so well define that word that it might be perfectly understood. But yet that definition, how exact and perfect soever, would never make a blind man understand it, because several of the simple ideas that make that complex one, being such as he never received by sensation and experience, no words are able to excite them in his mind. 14. Complex ideas definable only when the simple ideas of which they consist have been got from experience. Simple ideas, as has been shown, can only be got by experience from those objects which are proper to produce in us those perceptions. When, by this means, we have our minds stored with them, and know the names for them, then we are in a condition to define, and by definition to understand, the names of complex ideas that are made up of them. But when any term stands for a simple idea that a man has never yet had in his mind, it is impossible by any words to make them known its meaning to him. When any term stands for an idea a man is acquainted with, but is ignorant that that the term is the sign of, then another name of the same idea, which he has been accustomed to, may make him understand its meaning. But in no case whatsoever is any name of any simple idea capable of a definition. 15. Fourthly, names of simple ideas of less doubtful meaning than those of mixed modes and substances. Fourthly, but though the names of simple ideas have not the help of definition to determine their signification, yet that hinders not but that they are generally less doubtful and uncertain than those of mixed modes and substances, because they, standing only for one simple perception, men, for the most part, easily and perfectly agree in their signification, and there is little room for mistake and wrangling about their meaning. He that knows once that whiteness is the name of that color he has observed in snow or milk will not be apt to misapply that word, as long as he retains that idea, which, when he has quite lost, he is not apt to mistake the meaning of it, but perceives he understands it not. There is neither a multiplicity of simple ideas to be put together, which makes the doubtfulness in the names of mixed modes, nor a supposed, but unknown, real essence, with properties depending thereon, the precise number whereof is also unknown, which makes the difficulty in the names of substances. But, on the contrary, in simple ideas the whole signification of the name is known at once, and consists not of parts, whereof, more or less being put in, the idea may be varied, and so the signification of name be obscure or uncertain. 16. Simple ideas have few assents in linea predicamentali. Fifthly, this further may be observed concerning simple, simple ideas and their names, that they have but few assents in linea predicamentali, as they call it, from the lowest species to the summum genus. The reason whereof is that the lowest species being but one simple idea, nothing can be left out of it, that so the difference being taken away, it may agree with some other thing in one idea common to them both, which, having one name, is the genus of the other two, v.g., there is nothing that can be left out of the idea of white and red to make them agree in one common appearance, and so have one general name, as rationality being left out of the complex idea of man makes it agree with brute in the more general idea and name of animal, and therefore when, to avoid unpleasant enumerations, men would comprehend both white and red and several other such simple ideas under one general name, they have been fain to do it by a word which denotes only the way they get into the mind. For when white, red, and yellow are all comprehended under the genus or name color, it signifies no more but such ideas as are produced in the mind only by the sight, and have entrance only through the eyes. And, when they would frame yet a more general term to comprehend both colors and sounds, and the like simple ideas, they do it by a word that signifies all such as come into the mind only by one sense. And so the general term quality, in its ordinary acceptation, comprehends colors, sounds, tastes, smells, and tangible qualities, with distinction from extension, number, motion, pleasure, and pain, which make impressions on the mind and introduce their ideas by more senses than one. 17. Sixthly, 
names of simple ideas not arbitrary, but perfectly taken from the existence of things. Sixthly, the names of simple ideas, substances, and mixed modes have also this difference, that those of mixed modes stand for ideas perfectly arbitrary, those of substances are not perfectly so, but refer to a pattern, though with some latitude, and those of simple ideas are perfectly taken from the existence of things, and are not arbitrary at all, which, what difference it makes in the signification of their names, we shall see in the following chapters. Simple Modes The names of simple modes differ little from those of simple ideas. End of section 4